Hitler murdered millions of innocent people. What caused the greatest nation in Europe to follow him? Why did Catholics and Protestants shout, Sieg Heil, and look the other way as six million Jews were butchered and burned? What is the Hitler syndrome? Could it happen again? Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking today about the Hitler syndrome. When people give up their freedom for power and security. In the last segment, I was talking about this book. It's written by Dr. Alex Rari and it's called Protestants. I just want to read you a little section uh, out of this book because it talks about the Third Reich. So let me... Let me just give it to you. He says, The best modern scholarship was telling Christians that the universe was eternal with no beginning and no end. This is what they were taught in Germany before the Third Reich. So the universe is eternal, which means there's no God. That a progressive life force of some kind drove the world's development. That the Bible was a collection of myths forgeries with almost no roots in real history and that humanity was evolving to ever greater wisdom and virtue a virtue being defined in social darwinian terms that left little space for quaint notions like justice and mercy and so Germany was infiltrated in these liberal ideas, um, like other parts of the world today. Perhaps I shouldn't tell you where. But did you know this, that Nietzsche, who was the great architect of the Third Reich, is possibly in the schools of philosophy in the great American universities, he is the most popular author. Nietzsche, no God, that might is right. And the Bible is just a, what do you call it? It's a load of myths. And so when they got rid of the Bible, they got rid of the Old Testament. And when they got rid of the Old Testament, Hitler said, well, now we're going to get rid of the Jews. And so they murdered the Jews by the millions. It was like a repeat of the Inquisition. And we spoke about the Inquisition. How can, you, how can you understand that priests and bishops and religious people are going to burn men, women and children and they're going to burn them uh, and while the fat is fizzling in the fire, they will be singing their hymns. That's what they did. The Grand Inquisitor in Spain says that he personally burned 31,000 heretics. And most of those were Roman Catholics. Well, Hitler did the same. He had the gas chambers, the crematoriums. He had the great processions, just as they had the auto de fe and the singing of the hymns and the torches and the fires Hitler had exactly the same thing, uh, and uh, he had uh, the gas chambers, the crematoriums, uh, and uh, the great religious marches. If you see the, the great marches of the Nazis, they're like a great religious procession. They don't have the cross, they have the swastika, and they have the singing of tremendous hymns. You know, you listen to the uh, German soldiers as the German soldiers are marching down the road and they're singing these great, tremendous, patriotic songs. And everybody, millions and millions of people are shouting out, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. Almost all Christian churches behind it say, no, 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 that's not true. Uh, the atheists were behind it. The communists, no, no, they were killing the communists. Almost all the priests, few exceptions. The Pope himself was a supporter of Hitler, a fellow Catholic. You say, it's not true. 
It is true. It is history. Almost all ministers like me, almost all of the Protestants, and they did it because Hitler was against communism. Communism was atheism. So almost all supported Hitler, about 95% at least, and looked the other way when the Jews were murdered. Why? Because Hitler offered them bread, miracles, magic, power, security. Exactly what Satan offered Christ, and Christ turned him down. Now I spoke about Bonhoeffer. Uh, he, he's one of my heroes, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The British said, look, we've got a church here of Lutherans. Come on. No, he said, I can't. He went over for a while. But he said, I've got to go back to be with my people. The Americans said, we'll give you safe passage to the United States of America. This is a great country. He came over to America. He went to Harlem. He worshipped in the black churches and enjoyed it. He said, they've got some spirit. And we've, they've got some soul. And we've lost that in Germany. But when he smelt the burning flesh from the crematoriums, uh, he said, uh, I am going back to be with my people. He was a soldier. What about the others? 9th of April, 1945. Just two weeks before the American soldiers got there and liberated the death camp, they let him out and they hung him up. This man hung up, strung up, put to death because he had the power of no. He was not a conformist. He didn't fit in. Some people get on even church committees and all you can see them do is say, yes, 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 yes. It's my job. Yes, yes, yes. My security. Yes, yes. What about your conscience? It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Yes, yes. God understands. Yes, he does. He understands you're a coward. Mm -hmm. But this man was no coward. A Lutheran minister strung up by the neck. I think they used uh, piano wire. So he'd live longer. The question, of course, is what would we have done? The author of this book, Alex Ryrie, says, don't be too hard on the Germans. We weren't there. If we had been there, we probably would have done the same thing. You see? We would have done the same thing. But I'm not a fatalist because we have the capacity of choice. Because God loves us, he made us as free moral agents with the capacity to choose. You can't force me to go against Christ. And uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, I will follow my Christ. And he stood out against Hitler when his church supported Hitler. Of course, all the churches, all the churches with a few exceptions. Now, a last day scenario. Please look at Revelation 13 and verse 11. Revelation 13 and verse 11. Then I saw another beast, a kingdom, coming up, or a power, coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a, what does it say? A lamb spoke like a dragon. Now, many, many good Christians here in the United States of America say this is Protestant America. Goodness. The United States of America born in greatness, nurtured on the Protestant faith, immersed in individualism. What do you think of when you think of an American? I believe in freedom. That's what you think. A champion of civil and religious liberties a defender of freedom. Uh, America has, I think, above all other nations, the most glorious heritage. But the Bible says to speak like a dragon. 
Look at Revelation 13, verse 12. When did you last hear that preached, my friend? Revelation 13 and verse 12. I know of at least 20 million people in the world who believe this. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast, that's the beast of the Inquisition, in his presence and calls the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Therefore, he sets up an alliance with the beast of the Inquisition. You can read this in great controversy. And then verse 13. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. There you have miracles, mystery, magic. Cast yourself down. Do a miracle. Christ said, no, I don't want you to follow me because of the miracles. It is written. Miracles, mystery, and appeal to the senses. And then verses 16 and 17. Revelation 13, 16 and 17. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So I'm not going to go into this now because I'm going to tell you something. It's a lot more than what you think it is. (laughs) It is a mark of universal conformity. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He says, unless you do it, you're not going to get your bread. You won't be allowed to buy or sell. But join us, we're going to have the miracles. We're going to have the fire. And you're going to have security. But give us one thing, freedom. Give us freedom of choice. And as the old inquisitor said, why not? It's a terrible burden. Christ, you made a big mistake. Freedom is an intolerable burden. Most people don't want freedom. They want bread. And that, of course, is the voice of the Antichrist. So in the last days, people will be asked to give total conformity. there will come a great religious movement to force people into conformity. Look at me. We should not be conformists because we're simply pains. There are some people, we should not be, should I say, individuals just because we want to be different. We shouldn't be different for different sake. But we should be different for Christ's sake. And conformity in a religious crisis is kissing Christ on the cheek and saying, Hail Master. It's the act of Judas. The kiss. I ask this question, could it happen in America? Now you'll understand, I'm not talking politics. I'm not slightly involved in politics in Australia or in America. And I'm not ashamed to tell people I am fiercely independent. Now I know I'll probably fall out with everybody, but so be it. Let me tell you folks something. I don't want another bunch of people telling me how I ought to think. I don't want a big political party saying, you got to think and you got to march in step. Oh, oh, no, I don't want that. That's getting close to the mark of the beast. I don't want a church hierarchy saying to me, You've got to see it this way because I say 
My authority is not a hierarchy of the church. It is Jesus Christ speaking through his word, the Bible. Amen. You see? That's what a Protestant is supposed to be. And a lot of Catholics agree with me today on this. Okay, could it happen in America? We're not talking politics. I ask these questions. Don't answer them. Are people in America swayed by oratory in great rallies? Do people in America easily swallow and digest lies? Are people inflamed with hatred for each other? Do people put political parties before honor, duty, and country? Honor, duty, and country. God, honor, duty, and country. But do people put politics before that? Are people stirred up to hate other races like Hitler stirred them up to hate the Jews? I've got lots of Jewish friends. I've got two great Jewish doctors who work really hard to keep me going. <laughs> Some of my best friends are the Jews. But the Christians and the rest were stirred up in Germany to hate the Jews and to sing songs and march as they could smell them burning. Now, if you can say yes to any of these questions, then now is the time to resolve to follow Christ and not man. Remember Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Number two, to be when needed a nonconformist, not a troublemaker. Some people, you know, I've been a pastor for more than 50 years, and you have some people who just like to be nonconformist because they just want to cause trouble. We're not talking about pettiness and stupidities, we're talking about moral integrity. Not a troublemaker, but a person of conscience to refuse to go with the crowd when the crowd is going in the wrong direction. To vote against the hierarchy when the hierarchy is wrong. Oh, dear. To refuse the Hitler syndrome. So in the last days, the vast majority are going to not say Sieg Heil, but they're going to do the equivalent. They're going to get in lockstep. And today in the Western world, as an Australian, as an American, I can tell you, people are taught to conform and to go with the majority and not to think for themselves. That's getting people ready for the mark of the beast. And if you're that sort of person... And if you think you're secure in your salvation, so do the people in Germany who put Hitler on the seat of authority and great power. It's good to be a nonconformist when the times demand it. I'm going to take you now to the plains of Dura in Babylon. I want you to take your Bible and turn to Daniel 3, verses 1 and 6. Daniel 3 and verses 1 and 6. Nebuchadnezzar, type of Antichrist, the king, made an image of gold. Its height was 60 cubits, its width 6 cubits. He set it, up, set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And he cried out, he said, here is this thing. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Now, please, let's just think about it. Here are three young guys a long way from home. And when you're a long way from home and when you are a hated religious minority, it is not a comfortable feeling. Some people say, oh, I couldn't do this. I wouldn't be comfortable. God help you. We need to be uncomfortable for Jesus. 
and he asks us to be. Goodness me. I've heard people say, oh, it puts me out of my comfort zone. Say, would you like my handkerchief so you can cry? Come on. So here you've got three young men. This is big image that represents the Antichrist. The king says, you've got to fall down and you've got to worship this. If you don't worship it, into the burning fiery furnace. Uh, Daniel 3, verse 7, I think is the next verse I'm looking for. I think it's verse 7. So at that time when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, had a big orchestra here by the looks, the lyre in symphony with all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations and languages fell down on their noses in the dust and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, off it goes the music. What do they all do? All down. <laughs> That's the tyranny of the crowd. That's the Hitler syndrome. That's to go along with the majority. Whether the majority is right or not, but I've got to get my bread. I've got to get my security. What's my freedom? Freedom's not very important if I don't have security. So what's the choice? Well, if it's a choice, I'll have security any day. That, of course, leads to the mark of the beast. But there were three who wouldn't fall down. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> they wouldn't get down. Daniel 3, verse 15. This is just a little summary. The king says, Now if you're ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good, but if you do not, do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? So he says, I'm giving you one last shot at it. You better do it. And verse 16 he didn't realize whom he was dealing with. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. What don't you understand about no? That's the power of no. We will not bow down. No. What don't you get? So what they do, they take these three young guys, these young Jewish guys, they throw them into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. People say about the martyrs when they were burnt, oh, of course, you know, they didn't feel any pain. Oh, were you one of the martyrs? You come back to tell me. No. On the whole, the martyrs felt a lot of pain. If you're being frizzled with a slow fire, because sometimes they would wet the wood. So it took hours to burn them. Christians did this. In the name of God, people do all sorts of wicked things in the name of God. So these three young guys are thrown into the midst of a burning fiery furnace probably fueled with oil. I've been to that part of the world. I've been to the part of the world there where the oil is seeping out of the ground. I've been there. But <laughs> the Bible tells us they wouldn't budge. <laughs> they wouldn't bow. They wouldn't bend. And hallelujah, they wouldn't burn. <laughs> they wouldn't burn. And so the king, in the old translation, says he's astonished. <laughs> nice word, he's astonished. No, he's astonished. He says, come out. And um, we're told also in the Bible that there was another person who came down there. Not just three, another person came down. And he came and stood with them in the fire. That's the good thing. That's the gospel. That when you're thrown into the fire... There's somebody who will come down and stand with you in the fire. And so they come forth and the king says, I can't even smell the fire on you. This is a prelude to the story of the mark of the beast and the image of the beast. In the last days, in spite of the weak conformity that is encouraged in the world, God is going to have a people. Mm-hmm. 
And they won't budge. No. They won't bow. Not going to get down with their noses in the dirt. They're not going to be crawlers. Not going to be wimps. They will not, just won't bend. They're not going to bend. They're not going to, they're not going to bow down or bend or any of those things. And by the grace of God, they will not burn. And this story in the book of Daniel is written so that we who live in the time of the Hitler syndrome will have faith in God to stand for the truth though the heavens fall and to stand for Christ even when the fire is hot. God, my friend, will have a people in the last days who will defeat the Hitler syndrome and will go home with Jesus to glory for his praise. Amen and amen. There's only one thing that really counts in this lifetime, your relationship to Christ. And then if you have a right relationship with Christ, you want to tell people about Christ. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. By the grace of God, we're going to do that. We are doing that. That is why we're going back to Cuba, to this communist land, to preach Christ. We're accepting an invitation to go to the, the vast, huge city of Manila, the capital of the Philippines, been there before, but by the grace of God, we're going back. Please support us. And please stand with us in the preaching of the everlasting gospel. You say, how do you do it? Who, who pays the bills? We do. Do you get any help, financial help from the church? No, my friend, we don't. But we get a lot of help from God and from his children. Please support us in the preaching of the everlasting gospel. It's the most important work in all the world. Everything else is almost trivia. So would you please write to me? John Carter, Post Office Box, 1900 Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Do your best for Jesus. Do your best for the gospel. And uh, in Australia, write to me at Terrigal. And we promise you this, every dime, every dollar is going to be used to win souls to our Lord Jesus Christ. Please write to me today. Thank you and God bless you. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.